Hi, everybody. I just started it. Uh, I'm getting everything set, making sure I'm recording everything. Uh, I don't have any questions in the question area this time. So what I'm going to do instead is answer some questions that I got on YouTube uh, from some of the older podcasts, because I think they'll make uh, a pretty good new podcast. Uh, so I'm just going to start with those. But if you do have new questions, go ahead and post those to the, the Q&A app or uh, it, use the Q&A app. That's probably the, the way I'll notice it the most. Um, OK, so the, the first question that I wanted to ask was uh, somebody on the YouTube channel asked about development hell, uh, which I'm interpreting to mean like uh, games where everything doesn't go smoothly right? in the development process, which is every game. But uh, development hell would probably be incredibly off the rails, right? Uh, and usually, uh, that happens for a number of reasons. Uh, but the person writing the, the, the comment used Kickstarter as an example. And I think that actually opens up a pretty good topic, which is, uh, as developers, we know what it's like to be on the development hell end of things, right? And uh, it isn't at all like what players or uh, uh, games journalists seem to make it out to be because it's usually not anywhere near as interesting as as what those stories are about right a lot of the stories that you read like when a game gets pushed off or canceled or rebooted or something like that or, or you know anything that indicates that it, it didn't go according to the original plan that the developers announced to the public um, those are usually not bad things when that happens. Uh, that's usually happening because something has gone wrong and we need to fix it. Or in the case of the cancellation, something has gone so wrong that we can't fix it. And I thought I'd just talk about a couple instances where uh, stuff like that has happened to me and then talk about sort of why it happens and, and that sort of thing. So uh, one of the reasons that a game will get rebooted or pushed or canceled is, I mean, this is the most common reason, is you're running out of money or you're running out of time. Uh, usually, if you're using the normal developer-publisher model, uh, the, the publisher pays you, say, every month a certain amount of money while you're developing the game, right? And they have in mind a whole amount of money that they're willing to spend to make that game because they've run their numbers and they know that if, if they spend more than that, they're likely not to make it back, right? And making back uh, at least breaking even is important because that's how you get a sequel and sequels are how you get more money. Uh, so you don't really wanna go over those numbers so that you can at least see some money back, right? And if you're working on a sequel, you don't wanna go over those numbers because you're still hoping to get money back off the first one. So there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't wanna go over. I mean, another reason why you don't wanna go over budget is if you go over budget and there's no more money, nobody can get paid and your studio closes down, right? That's another reason. Uh, so usually, if something is going really, really, really bad, it gets canceled before anybody hears about it. You know, usually people hear about it years after the fact when um, you know someone who's not working at that company anymore is working somewhere else and talked about you know one of the projects they were working on or showed a piece from their portfolio from that project. Like I worked on a, a, a canceled crash uh, platformer and a canceled crash racing game, both of which are known about uh, in terms of like uh, uh, being told things about them. But what happened on them is, uh, you know, usually when you're when you're when you're working on a game uh, and there's a good YouTube, uh, I'll back up. Uh, one of my teachers, Mark Cerny he had something called method, right, which is this way of developing games uh, procedurally. And he broke it down into two halves. And there's a video on YouTube about this if you want to see it. It's called Method. Just search for it. Uh, method Mark Cerny, and you'll find it. Um, it was a presentation he gave at the DICE conference. Anyway, he divided development up into two big sections. Right There's the pre-production section, which is the small bit at the beginning. And that's where you're trying to, he, he calls it capturing lightning. Right, You're trying to find the fun, you're trying to prove that this idea that you had uh, can work, right? That it's not just a one trick pony that you won't fizzle out 
near the end of it, right? That it, it has enough legs to keep going. And the end result of that is a first playable, which represents a small portion, but representative portion of the game. And then the publisher looks at that and decides whether they want to go forward into production. And a lot of games don't make it from pre-production into production. And that was what happened with both of those games for different reasons. I can't talk about the specific reasons for those games uh, yet, because uh, I'm still under NDA. But uh, usually what it is, is it's something like, um, uh, you know, in the, uh, I told you I was working on a, a racing game and a platformer at the same time. Um, the, the two were supposed to come out at, at, at similar times, right? But when one gets canceled, we have to reevaluate the other. So that's another reason why it might uh, uh, get out. So running out of time, running out of money, hitting, hitting the end of pre-production and not having enough to go forward, uh, that's usually uh, a point. Usually at that point, either a publisher will ask them to do another pre-production, right? Or try to get the idea worked on by a different studio to do pre-production, you know, or if it's a publisher who owns a bunch of developers, then they can get uh, their developers to do a whole bunch of little pre-production prototypes and send them in and they can pick which one, right? So sometimes, you know, there will be six or seven prototypes and only one will be taken and the rest will be canceled and those other teams will get something else to do. Um, what happens a lot less frequently is, uh, besides rebooting or just running out of money and getting canceled is getting more time. And getting more time is always good news. Uh, just like actually getting canceled is kind of good news because it means that something that probably wasn't going to live up to the quality expectations you had for it didn't get sent out and marketed and you, you didn't pay for it, right? You didn't essentially get your money taken away from you. So that's a good thing, right? Even when uh, uh, a project, you know, if a project gets rebooted, that's good because it means that they trust the concept and they're trying to give someone else a chance to take a shot at it. When it gets more time, that's even better usually because that means that we've gone into production, we've created a whole bunch of stuff and we're looking at it and we think, oh God, this, this looks great, but we can't finish it in the time we were originally saying we could finish it, right? So usually what happens is everybody gets together, they figure out, okay, is this the time when we cancel it or is it the time when we give it more time? And you know, if you cancel, you cancel it if there's not enough worth to it, right? And you don't cancel it if you think there's some awesome stuff that you just need more time for. So then you go look for extra money. If you can find the money, it gets prolonged and then hopefully released, right? Uh, I've worked on a few projects that got prolonged. Uh, let's see. Um, we got some extra time on Spyborgs, uh, although that was a reboot more than an extra time thing. We remade that in six months. Uh, which is, if you want to talk about development hell, I can talk about that. Uh, and uh, But Skylanders, the first one, we worked on it for a while. I mean, I think Toys for Bob had been working on it for a couple of years before we, uh, uh, they, they finally rebooted it into Skylanders. And then they were working on Skylanders for a while. And then that got extended because everybody could see the potential, but it needed a lot more put into it in order to, you know, be successful, right? So... That's usually how those things work. It's usually just driven by necessity. Um, what I would describe as development hell is usually crunch periods, which are pretty uh, widespread. But when you get into crunch happening more often than not crunch, I, thought, I think about that as development hell. It means that your, your scheduling has gone so far off the rails that the only way for you to get everything back on time and you know not on budget because you're doing overtime, but at least on time is to just do this horrible amount of crunching. And if people believe in a project, they'll usually do it pretty happily, right? But sometimes, you know, they'll get to a point, they've been working on this for a long time, everyone's fatigued, right? And then uh, uh, they just don't have the energy to push that forward, right? So sometimes that happens. But in the case of, uh, of of Spyborgs, right? We were initially trying to make sort of a Saturday morning cartoon uh, type thing. We changed that midway uh, based on uh, feedback from audience and user groups and stuff to be more like uh, a, a superhero show, right? Uh, and then after that, based on even more 
uh, demographic research. Capcom wanted us to change it to being for 18 year olds. So that was the six month reboot. We changed it to be for that. Um, so anyway, that's sort of my perspective on development hell. If anybody has any more questions about it, please ask those and I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so the second question I wanted to ask uh, for, or answer for today was, uh, Someone asked me if I think that being a developer means that I have different opinions about aspects of games compared to other people, and I do. Uh, I mean, one of the examples I always give is uh, the Clank gameplay in Ratchet and Clank, at least in the first few. We were always really dissatisfied with it, mainly not, not because we didn't like it or we thought it wasn't fun or something, but because we didn't feel like the Clank gameplay was asking enough interesting questions of the player, right? Mainly what it was doing was contributing a lot of incredibly charming theatrics to very uh, basic questions to make those basic questions seem fun, right? And that's good to do if it takes up as little of the game as our Clank sections did. But we always wanted to try to do more with it, and we couldn't figure out how. But players loved it, right? They just loved that break where they could do some cool theatrical stuff with Clank and then get back into Ratchet. So it just goes to show that we weren't necessarily on, you know, our design goals didn't necessarily match up with player expectations. And that happens a lot. Uh, and what the first few times it happened to me, I realized was it's not my job as a designer to decide if the game I'm making is fun, right? That's the player's job. Uh, I know what I think is fun but I'm not making the game for me. I will never buy a copy of my own game. I'm making it for you, right? So what you think matters in terms of whether it's fun or not. And the only way to find that out, you know, in general is to do user testing, which is why we do it so much. Uh, the more you work on an individual game though, the more out of touch you get with what players might think is fun in that game because you've been playing it every day, broken, right? And the, over the course of development, what you thought was really fun at the beginning, now you've played it a hundred times. You don't have that perspective anymore, right? So a lot of times, especially like in the developer commentaries, when we have negative perspectives on a part of a game, it's usually because that part of a game was very difficult and caused us a lot of pain making it, which sometimes we're proud of if it came out well and sometimes we're ashamed of didn't come out well, right? So that's why we're having uh, uh, sort of a different reaction to it than the players might have, because we actually had to bring it into being, and that usually involves some manner of pain. Uh, the the other thing that that question brings up for me is what's fun for me has changed significantly since I started making games. Um, when I started making games originally, I thought that the goal of the game designer was to present the player with a wall to climb, right? And that how you got fun was you made that wall as impenetrable as possible. So the player had to try as hard as possible to get through it. That was an incomplete idea of what was fun because I was playing games that appeared to be that way to me and so without knowing what was going on behind the scenes to actually make them fun for me, I assumed that the thing that was making them fun was that satisfying grind, right? Uh, and as I've learned more about what goes into creating that satisfying wall climb that doesn't have anything to do with making the wall impenetrable and difficult, it has a lot to do with uh, what I've been writing about in my articles, you know, asking the players questions and making sure they have the tools to answer those questions. So my, my view has shifted over time. So now when I play games that present just a wall and not any of the other hidden things, I can't have fun with those anymore because, uh, and this leads into my next point, I can't just play a game anymore. Uh, whenever I'm playing, I'm, I'm also analyzing it, you know, if, I, if I'm enjoying a game a lot, 
I might only analyze it a little bit the first time I go through and then go through it again to analyze it a lot. But it's always at least a little bit work for me to play games now. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because it means I get to enjoy video games on a different level than I did before. For example, uh, I like to give the example when I was playing Grand Theft Auto 3 and Mary was watching me and uh, I needed some health so I said out loud, okay, where would I put the health if I was designing this? And I thought, okay, I put it over there. So I ran over and I just hit the mic in case anybody heard that. So I ran over there and sure enough there was health and Mary started laughing maniacally, right? Because she thought it was just hilarious. Uh, but that's sort of my experience now is I know the moves behind everything, right? So I don't see the magic trick anymore, right? I see the moves, I see the cards up the sleeve, and there's a satisfying element to that, but it is very different, right? So that's probably one reason why developers tend to have such different ideas of, uh, of what's fun, you know, from players. Um, what I'm kind of angling towards on that is that quality matters more to us. Quality in terms of skillful and, and craft, like good craft, a crafty execution of the product becomes more important to us than almost anything else, or at least for me and a lot of the people that I know, because we, we're so busy and playing games feels like work now, right? That the time that you have to devote to a specific game is precious. And so you don't really wanna tolerate anything that isn't going to give you something new or something really well done. Uh, and so I at least end up playing a lot fewer games, except when I'm doing specific research uh, on how to design something, in which case I'll play a lot of games that have that sort of, uh, uh, mechanic to them, right? If I'm designing a card game, I'll go play a ton of card games, right? And I'll see what the design space looks like currently and try to figure out where I can innovate in that space, right? Uh, but that's not play per se. It's more work, right? So the ones I play for, for play are, are further between and, uh, and you know, maybe one or two of those come out a year like Fallout or, or Skyrim. Uh, and even those, you know, I'm still analyzing while I'm playing them, but at least they're high enough quality that that doesn't matter that much to me, right? Uh, I, they're teaching me something, so that's exciting there, and they're fun, right? So I, I then get it on those two levels, which is probably why I'm so picky, because now I need that on two levels instead of just that one. Um, so that's, that's the, the second question. I wanted to... Uh, circle back a bit to the development hell question. Um, I think the um, the Kickstarter aspect of that question is very interesting because it's dragging into the light a lot of things that we as developers have just been experiencing behind the scenes. And uh, uh, it's not things that are bad, but it's realities about making games that aren't interesting, right? They're not good stories. They don't, they don't help sell, you know, uh, articles. So journalists don't really care that much. They're not obvious or interesting. So players don't really care that much. And because they're not obvious or interesting, there's not really that much incentive for us as developers to talk about them unless we're specifically trying to educate people. Um, and so the, but Kickstarter seems to be blending those lines a lot because then the players also become the publisher, right? They are, each individual one of them is now your boss. Whereas before you were making the game for them, they were your client, now they're your boss. So they have to know all of the, the information that might be boring to some people, but wouldn't necessarily be boring to someone who's put their own money into the project. So examples of this are things like uh, a game project which goes on for a long period of time, gets feature creeped, right, a lot, and then ultimately collapses and doesn't get put out. Uh, that's something that happens all the time in games, but you don't see it because the product never got announced, right, because it hadn't hit that point yet. Or for products that did get announced, you don't see what happens because there's zero 
incentive on the developer's end or the publisher's end to tell you what happened, right? Because A, it's a long list of incredibly boring things, and B, that long list of incredibly boring things is in, in very easy to misunderstand, right? Which is why you get a lot of uh, articles, uh, not articles, uh, forum posts and things like that, which attribute malice uh, to the dissolution of a game project that doesn't actually exist. Um, I talked about reasons why it happens, uh, you know, running out of money, uh, not being able to hit the fun by the time you need to. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it happens for other reasons, right? Like uh, the publisher, who's a public company, is being pressured by its shareholders and the company that owns the majority share to increase shareholder value. And so they need to add microtransactions into n number of games. You retrofit a game to add microtransactions into it, the game doesn't come out, right? That's, that's the way it happened. Or similarly, instead of microtransactions, just insert necessary thing here according to the shareholders. Now the shareholders have a completely different set of priorities than the developer or the players or anybody else, right? But their priorities are part of what shapes the game, right? Uh, I've never worked on a game where some incredibly crazy request didn't come down from the money people at least once a month, if not more. And often, right, that thing improves the game a lot. And also often, that thing takes a lot of work away from something else in the game. And if you don't have the time or the money to do that, well, you're screwed. Uh, or you have to cut something major out of your game, right? Or you have to go into development hell and crunch as hard as you can to try to get everything that you wanted into the game. So uh, you make a plan that's this big. You discover that to make it fun, you need something that's this big. And you discover that to meet the goals of, 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 of the financial, the financial goals of your game, it then needs to be that big, right? And something has to give. And sometimes what gives is the project itself. And no, it's not good when that happens. And nobody thinks it was a good idea that that happened. And nobody thinks, you know, it was, it was probably for the best that the shareholders wanted that because, you know, they really needed to improve shareholder value. No, nobody does that. Everybody thinks, that was a terrible move. We need to learn from that and not do it again, right? And usually when it happens again, it's a whole different set of people doing it again, right? So uh, you see, it's not really a sexy topic. It's just a boring set of mistakes that continue to happen over and over and over again. And so look like some sort of a pattern. And it's easy to make up a story out of that, right? The developer's trying to cheat us. The developer hates the players. Publishers are evil. Developers are good. You know, uh, uh, games shouldn't be made for money because money ruins everything. Games should only be made for money because otherwise, how could they be made, right? Any of those extremist positions miss the point, right? Which always falls in a very complicated bundle in the middle. Uh, Nolan Bushnell, the inventor of the Atari and some would say the home console, right? He said that a complicated, or sorry, a simple explanation that is satisfying will always have more power in the world than a complicated one that is true. And he's right, right? So what I'm trying to get across here is not necessarily all of the complications involved with development hell or with those sorts of things, but I'm trying to give you a sense of how complicated those situations are and how when you see stories, that tie together little specific elements of that train to make it seem like something's being done intentional or that there was some logic or rhyme or reason to it, that's usually not the case. It's usually just a bunch of mistakes happen. Uh, and you know, you have to live with it. Uh, and that's game development. So let me check and see if I got any more questions while I was talking. Uh, nope. So let me just check the comments because sometimes they come in there. Nope. Okay, so that'll that'll be it for the first podcast this month. Uh, there'll be another one later for the ten dollar plus subscribers. I'm having that on Halloween. I may or may not 
wear a costume. I don't actually own a costume right now, so I would have to go buy one. Uh, and I don't really have a lot of money, so I'm not sure. But if I can't do a costume, I will at least have a Halloween-themed prop. Uh, so you can at least look forward to that. So I'll talk to you then. Uh, in the meantime, thank you again for donating to the Patreon campaign. I really appreciate it. Uh, I had to make a bunch of changes to it this month, and so far nobody has given up on me, which is great. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I'm looking forward to doing more stuff. So talk to you later.